Hi everyone, I'm really excited to give a talk here today. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk to you about a project from my PhD thesis about how female mate choice might be promoting the persistence of a hybrid population and indeed promoting hybrid speciation in the common European river rats. Uh, yeah, so I'll get right into it. Yeah, my slides will go. So hybridization is widespread throughout the tree of life. Uh, typically, when people are thinking about the outcomes for hybridization, they're thinking about the uh, negative consequences, things like hybrid breakdown and hybrid dysfunction. However, we know from modern genomic studies that actually there are positive outcomes, uh, adaptive alleles that can intergress between diverging lineages and then rise to high frequency. So hybridization plays a key role within speciation. Now, I study hybrids between two ant species, Formica aquilonia and Polyphena, where we can actually see both of these negative and positive outcomes of hybridization, but I'll get to that later. So uh, this is a map that we published a few years ago, and we showed widespread hybridization between these two lineages. Each of these is a population that we sampled, and the pie charts represent the proportion of mitochondrial DNA haplotypes belonging to each of these two parents that we found within each of these populations. So where we see the mixing of the haplotypes, we might expect hybridization. But when we went in with microsatellite markers, what we actually found was um, a hybridization was pretty much everywhere. There's, uh, there were traces of hybridization almost everywhere. And indeed, from the mitochondrial markers, we found that there were several instances of independent hybridization going on between these different lineages. So what's going on? We wanted to know more about uh, what is perhaps promoting hybridization. And one key mechanism that might be doing that is mate choice. So mate choice is a vital part of hybridization. If, they, if there's no discrimination between your partner, be it from your own species or from another, or be it a hybrid, then uh, you would expect gene flow to be really common and just going on all the time. But we, we think that uh, if there is any kind of feedback, such as reinforcement towards hybridization and uh, mate choice, then perhaps you might get the persistence of hybrid populations. And this is really important because uh, actually in the literature, you don't see many studies that come from the perspective of hybrids and the persistence of the hybrid populations. Typically, they come from the perspective of a parental population and how they might persist. So uh, without further ado, uh, the questions that we wanted to really ask from this system are, um, one, uh, do we think that, uh, or do we find any uh, patterns of mate choice in the hybrids and the parentals? So for this, uh, we put virgin queens and males into a glass box in an experiment to look for mate choice. And then part two, oh, I'm sorry, that's the doorbell. And then part two, um, can we detect any mate choice in nature? So if you can detect it in uh, a laboratory experiment, can you detect it from nature? Uh, so for this, I went and collected old queens. They can live for many years. And um, from these, I pulled out the spermatheca and looked at the genotypes of the males that they're mating with compared to the queens from which I pulled them. And then lastly, we wanted to know something about what are the fitness consequences for these hybrids? What does it mean to be a hybrid? And what is the, what is the result of that? And for that, I was collecting and rearing the eggs to look at hatching success from hybrids and parents. So for the first part, do hybrids and parents exhibit any kind of mate choice? So this was work done by our enthusiastic intern student or our exchange student, Bendik Birkingstad, who used a glass box to try and mimic natural conditions in uh, light conditions where the ants would naturally sort of fly and meet and mate. And he exposed queens uh, to different pairwise combinations of males. So parents, hybrids, and different parents. And uh, so from the perspective of hybrids, we wanted to know, or from the perspective of the queens, we wanted to know how often or what proportion of the mating attempts by different males were um, successful. Which and that would be that would be an indication of mate choice. So we can see that the from these hybrid queens that they don't really discriminate between the aquilonia parent and the hybrids. 
but they do discriminate against the pharmacopolitana, the alternative parent or the other parent that's coming in. And uh, these are both significantly different. So there's clear discrimination going on here. And then when we looked at, or when Bendick looked at the um, copulations, successful copulations with the parental Aquilonia-like queen, he saw that they very strongly distinguished between the hybrids and the Aquilonia. Now, one thing to really draw your attention to here is that the y-axis are actually slightly different, and that this would probably be on the level of the polyctena-like matings for these hybrid queens, which would suggest that these Aquilonia queens are just, they're just more picky. They are, they're not really interested in mating as frequently. They're not so loosey-goosey, maybe. I shouldn't say that. No. Anyway, so this is all very interesting. There's clearly discrimination going on in spite of the fact that we see widespread hybridization. So then it's definitely worth to go and look at the actual resultant mate choice in nature. So for this, I went out and collected queens. This is a mat of uh, ants that form on the tops of nests in the spring. You can see a little bit of snow melting there. And you have to dig through this and find a queen. And these old queens, they can live, I think, five years or maybe even more in nature. And uh, so, sorry if this is a bit gory, <laughs> I went and uh, genotyped parts of their thorax and also the spermatheca, this little tiny jelly bean I've exposed on the, on the tip of her abdomen. And then we could genotype the sperm there and in her thorax. And then this is what I got when I plotted a PCA using the R package higher stat. So each point is, a, um, is an individual on this PCA and the triangles are the male spermatheca genotypes with the circles being females. And you can clearly see that the hybrids and the parents are very distinct clusters on this PCA. And there isn't really much interbreeding going on in nature. Now, um, the significance of that might be diminished slightly because we know that the ants don't disperse that much, if you remember back to Loftus talk on Monday. So there might not be many opportunities for there to be hybridization. But then we see such widespread hybridization, but still we might then expect that these hybrid populations actually persist in nature as a result of this diminished gene flow from external sources, uh, which is certainly interesting or perhaps good news if you're into hybrids, you're rooting for them. So then we wanted to understand more, what are the fitness consequences for these hybrids? We can see that they're persisting. So what is it like for it to be a hybrid? What are their consequences? And so it was like the eggs from the queen genotyped in the previous question. And I let, I developed, I let that egg develop on Petri dishes until they developed into these cute little larvae that you see here. And this is an egg with a developing larvae inside. And I did this for both parents and for hybrids to give some kind of baseline, some comparison. So there is no difference in the number of eggs laid by parental queens. Each of these is a point, each point is a queen, I mean and these are the hybrids. There's no significant difference in these numbers of eggs laid. However, the proportion of eggs that hatch from hybrids is 83% lower. So if you're a hybrid, 83% less of your eggs will hatch compared to a parental um, queen. But this was under laboratory conditions, and it, so it is worth taking that into account that it wasn't a natural setting. Um, but what, we, what this might mean for the hybrids, we're not really sure because this doesn't necessarily represent the number of individuals that develop all the way to being parents. If uh, you think in an, in an ant nest, a typical ant nest, they typically uh, thin the herd a little bit and the larvae that hatch first definitely cannibalize the eggs as I saw myself in my experiment. So whether this really constitutes some serious burden for the hybrids, even though they're so much worse than the parents, we don't really know yet but it certainly looks like a strong consequence for them to be a hybrid. There's certainly strong consequences there. So to wrap up, um, we clearly saw evidence of mate choice and discrimination in laboratory conditions, which is unusual given the, how, how much uh, hybridization we see in nature. And we saw minimal interpopulation uh, mating between these different populations between the parents and the hybrids in nature. And then lastly, there were clear uh, associations for being a hybrid with lower hatching success of their brood. 
Um, and then what is the significance of this for the persistence of the hybrids? I would guess that in the long term, these hybrid populations are going to persist. They're clearly a feature of the Finnish landscape. Uh, and that's something that I'm really interested about is that hybrid speciation in itself. I don't really know, but that's for later studies. And with that, I would love to thank everybody who worked on this project with me. There were so many fantastic people. Bendik did so much of that field work. Elisa helped me in the field and in the lab. And Rose and Yomna are, were instrumental in making this project happen. It's, their, it's been their baby at the beginning, at least. Um, so yeah, with that, I'd like to invite your questions and thank you for listening.